Thank you so much for tuning in to this teaching from Mission Church. We hope that today's message meets you exactly where you're at and helps you in your journey in finding and following Christ. We don't want you to miss any of our messages here, so be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and to our podcast. And as always, if you are in the area, we would love to meet you. We are right here at 82 Stratford Drive every Sunday morning, and we cannot wait to worship and learn with you. But for now, let's dive in to today's teaching. Bible, go ahead and open up to Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, uh, uh, we'll give you one. Uh, We're also going to pull this up on the screen for you. Jonah chapter 3. Let me catch you up. January, this January, every Sunday has been terrible weather except for today. And so there's a bunch of you, this is your first time to mission or this is your first time in this year to mission. We've been covering some ground in the month of January in the life story of Jonah in the Old Testament book called Jonah. Jonah was a prophet of God, and God called Jonah to go to this city called Nineveh, the capital city of the Syrian Empire. Uh, Nineveh was a dark place. Uh, It was a place you did not want to go. The Syrians were the most powerful people on planet Earth, and Jonah finally gave in, and he went to Nineveh. He was on this mission with God, and he opened his mouth. This was last week. He preached an eight-word sermon. Uh, My sermon today will be more than eight words. We're already beyond that. But he preached an eight-word sermon that changed the city. God moved in a historic way. Repentance all throughout the city. Cut to the heart. The most powerful were on their knees. Incredible what was happening in the city of Nineveh. No one saw this coming. Except for maybe Jonah, and we'll find out why in in chapter four. It says this in chapter three. The king, listen, the king. You could say the most powerful person on planet earth. He's recognizing in this moment in chapter three that there is one person that is yet more powerful than he, God. He says, let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. What will God do? It says, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. This is amazing. Make sure that you know this. Repentance always moves the heart of God. If you want to catch the attention of God, repent. And by the way, repent, repentance, is not a one and done thing in the Christian life. This is actually a rhythm that you and I would constantly be evaluating and say, come Holy Spirit, look at my life. Is there anything in my life that is not pleasing to you? That you and I would actually have an ongoing rhythm of turning from our ways and turning back to the Father. This is what we see catches and moves the heart of God. Repentance does this. So here's what happens. The whole city, the repenting. Jonah is a prophet of God. His job was to speak what God put on his heart. You would think, That when a prophet of God would speak what God puts on his heart and then sees the outcome being mass repentance, you would think as we get to chapter four that we will find Jonah doing the prophet end zone dance. You would think that when we get to chapter four, I mean, this is like widespread revival breaking out, that we will find Jonah just praising God, being amazed at how awesome God is and how he's worked through his simple little little eight-word sermon. That's not what we find. Chapter four, verse one says, this plan, this change of plans greatly upset Jonah. And he became very what? Angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. This is fascinating. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? This is why I ran away to Tarshish. Now, pause. That's actually not recorded. We didn't know that until right now. We thought Jonah ran because of how dangerous Nineveh was. No, no. It's just because you hadn't read chapter 4 yet. We thought Jonah didn't want to go 
because he might get there and they might wipe him out. Chapter four actually tells us the condition of Jonah's heart. It was because of hatred in his heart. It was because of this tribalism and this is what can happen to you. Your world gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Jonah didn't want to go because the Ninevites were his enemy. They were his enemy. He he said, God, I knew you'd do this. I knew it. If I did this, this is why I ran to Tarshish. He said, I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God. Oh, someone needs to hear this. Slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. Jonah knew this. Do we? You are eager to turn back from destroying people. That's what Jonah says. Verse (laughs) 3, just kill me now, Lord. If you're wondering how much hatred occupied the heart of this prophet toward the people of Assyria, the Ninevites, there it is. God, you can just wipe me out now. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. So last week... We thought he was preaching this sermon from this place of like, oh man, this would be amazing, right? If they actually do what I'm preaching. No, no, no. No, that actually wasn't in his heart. When he was preaching that short little sermon, what was in his heart is, I so hope they actually don't do what I'm saying because I want to see my enemies wiped out. Fast forward way down the road, God in the flesh comes, Jesus, and he says, here's the deal. Um, Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. He wasn't just riffing, making it up on the spot as if this isn't who he's always been. This is so convicting. I don't know who your enemy is, you guys, but I'd be willing to bet you know. (laughs) And you think about them, and you thought about them. And this is what God is doing right now through his word. He is showing us his heart and just how different Jonah's heart is from his. This is convicting. For Jonah, it was about his people. For God, it was about all people. For Jonah, it was about his tribe. For God, it's about every tribe. Jonah was mad. God was merciful. Don't miss the conviction that God is wanting to bring in your heart right now. Those people. You know who those people are. Have you thought, can I remind you, that for God so loved the, the world. Isn't this convicting? It's amazing how self-righteous we can become. It's amazing how we can be so convinced that God is also making all of our enemies his enemy, yet God is a God filled with compassion and mercy that wants to see the world bend their knee to him. Jonah wanted to die. For God so loved the world, God reminded me as I prepped for this week to preach to you today how important it is to be careful. In times where you feel like your world is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and at the same time, you don't even realize it, you think the love of God is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, but it isn't. That's not who God is. Global heart, heart for all nations, longing to see more and more people come to a saving relationship with him. Um, I wanna make a little side note here that this was revealed in Jonah's heart when Jonah said yes to go on mission with God. We gather, we grow, and we go. And it's easy to make the mistake to think that as you go missionally, that's no longer like spiritual formation. I would argue, because of my life and what I've experienced, that's actually when the most spiritual formation happens. (laughs) It's when you get out there among people you don't like, neighbors that drive you crazy, buddies that voted differently and think they're right, that, oh my goodness, God actually wants to rescue their life too. It's on mission that our hard hearts are revealed. The last 10 years of leading this church with our leadership team, God has revealed how often my heart needs to change. How often my heart looks nothing like his heart. As you go missionally in missional communities, as you get ready through our growth track, just get ready. Out there is when God does the most revealing work of just how much we need him. It says this in verse five, then Jonah went out to the east side, east side of the city. Okay. He made a shelter 
to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. All right, so he packs a lunch. He brings out the Weber, and he's like, I'm hoping God changes his mind again and wipes these people out. This is how much he hated these people. Now, here's the thing. You gotta understand, like, his hatred towards these people, it actually made a lot of sense when you understand how terrible these people were. So Jonah, he, he actually packs a lunch. This is what he does. He's just hoping and hoping and hoping. Now, I thought about this. What would happen to Jonah when he goes back to his little tribe, to his people, and has to tell them what happened in Nineveh? Is he going to get back to his little people who all think the same way, believe the same thing, and all of a sudden his people are going to say, there's Jonah, the accomplice to mercy. He was the one that God used to save all the people we hate. I don't know. That's just a little sidebar, something I was thinking about. So he packs a lunch. He's hoping. He's hoping that he's going to see the city completely wiped out. Now, it would way down the road in history, but not in this moment. Verse 6 says this, And the Lord God, say it with me, arranged. All right, this is a key word in our passage today. It'll happen a few times. Underline it, highlight it. God is sovereign. He's working. And the, and the Lord God arranged for a leafy plant to grow there. And soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort. And Jonah was very grateful for the plant. All right, we're gonna see a couple things that God does. Here's the first one, God relieves. God relieves Jonah. Does Jonah deserve relief in this moment? No. And this is a window into the heart of God. God is not waiting for you to clean up your life and then he's gonna start blessing it. This is interesting, is it not? Our God is that good. Our God is that merciful. I look back over my life, the times, the seasons when I was running from God, he was still doing work in my life. He's that good. He's that merciful. In this moment, when Jonah is full of all this self-righteousness and he is so angry at God because of God's mercy, God still blesses, he provides, he relieves Jonah. If you've been in Arizona before, it's a similar climate as where Jonah was. If you've been there in the summer, sorry, it's terrible, don't go. But if you've been there in the summer and you've been out in the sun, you're like, I need an umbrella, otherwise I'm going to die. This is what God is doing. God in his goodness, he provides for Jonah even when Jonah does not deserve it. Psalm 103 verse eight says, the Lord is compassionate and gracious. Gracious, I just said gracious. <laughs> I have Tarshish on the mind. <laughs> That's good. Gracious. The Lord is compassionate. <laughs> compassionate. Oh, man. The Lord is compassionate. <laughs> it's been a week. And gracious. <laughs> Slow to anger, abounding in love. <laughs> he is. Don't miss what God is doing in this moment for Jonah. Um, how many of you have ever been on a beach trip, beach vacation? Show of hands. You've been to the beach before. Okay, a lot of us. Uh, if you've been to the beach, you know how it works on the beach. Let's just say that uh, you went there with your family or with your wife. You know that uh, the sun is hot. That's why you went there. But you also know that if you don't wake up early, you don't get the prime real estate or the umbrella. You guys following? And this is, this is frustrating because you went on the beach trip to sleep in. But you know if you actually sleep in, you're going to get in a fight with your wife later on that morning because you're in the back row and you can't even see the water, Right? <laughs> this is, you just experience this. Okay, so, so here's what I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine at night, you and your wife get into a fight there at the beach. And in this rare occasion, guys, rare occasion, you're actually in the right. <laughs> She's wrong. Some of, I thought you, some of you guys were gonna say amen. Okay, she's wrong. It is a rare, it's like a solar eclipse. She's really wrong in this occasion, okay? We're just making this up. She's wrong. You're right, she's, okay, you're following, good. <laughs> that came from a deep place. <laughs> and you go to bed, and your alarm goes off at like 5.30 or 6, and you see it, and you know why your alarm goes off. It's reminding you to get up, to go out to the beach, to get the umbrella, because you're going to serve your wife. But you're right, and she's, yeah, and you roll over as your alarm goes off, and you look at your bride, what do you do in that moment? Yeah, you keep sleeping. That's what you do. 
You know, I was thinking about this. Like everything in you would say, no, I'm entitled to keep sleeping. Why would I, why would I do anything to bless her in this moment? What she said to me last night, what she did to me last night, there's no, just no way. This is, this is what's going on in Jonah. God is so good. In this moment, we're seeing the heart condition of Jonah, full of self-righteous anger. And yet God gets up to make shade for Jonah. Why? This is who God is. He relieves. He is a God of love. When you least deserved it, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for you. That means in the very act of sinning, in the very act of breaking the heart of God, in the very act of rebelling against a good God, God said, I'm going to go down. I'm going to go down there, and I'm going to give myself. On the cross, Jesus, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Are we seeing the heart of God accurately today? I hope we are. This is what God does in Jonah chapter 4. He, he brings relief when Jonah did not deserve it. Paul says in Romans that God's kindness leads us to repentance. God was so patient because he is so patient. But it's really important to notice what I'm about to say. Do not confuse God's patience with God's permission. It's so important. Don't confuse this. God is good. And he blesses and loves people that do not deserve it. But you cannot confuse that with permission to keep on living in your own self-righteousness. God makes shade for Jonah. But you got to understand, not so that Jonah would keep on living in this place under the shade. The story continues. Verse 7 makes it clear. But God also, here's our word, arranged for a worm. The next morning at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away. Verse 8. And as the sun grew hot, God what? God, yeah. He arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. He said this, death is certainly better than living like this. Second thing that God does, God refines. God refines. God, he arranged the shade and he arranged the storm. This is what God does. He is our great refining God. Why? Proverbs 3.12, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves. This is what a good parent would do. Good parents do not stand in the way of consequences coming toward their children. Good parents. Now, I've been incredibly blessed and fortunate to have two really good parents. They're not perfect, but man, they're good. And as I was prepping for this week, I was reminded of a, a family story uh, about my oldest brother that I thought we could all talk about. <laughs> and <laughs> so my dad, is, he's good. He's a good dad. And um, my brother, uh, he's about maybe 18 years old at the time. Now, uh, you may not know this, but Stratford Square Mall used to be the place. Show of hands, how many of you remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to go to Sabaro and get a slice. Huh? Maybe walk around a few laps, see what's going on. Huh? You guys, it was, it was a place. It was a place. Well, right about that time, right, it was years ago, my, there, there's a store that opened, and it was the store. It's called American Eagle. Now, it's making a comeback, I've been told. But back then, it was the place. And one day, my brother Jason, my oldest brother, he came home. I think the leather belt was braided, and they would tie the loop. He came home saying, guess who's employed by American Eagle? This guy. And he had, like, the American Eagle outfit on, and, and we were pretty amazed by it. So he's working at American Eagle. And I think a month or two or three goes by, and all of a sudden, he starts uh, missing work. Right, this is years ago. He's a hard worker now, but he wasn't back then. And... Um, <laughs> Some days, he just decides to roll up like 15 minutes late. Now, if you want to fire up my dad, just be late to something, okay? Well, one night, this is the way I remember it at least, we're at the dinner table. That's a really important caveat. It's the way I remember it at least. We were at the dinner table. <laughs> dad, you can verify this. The phone rings. And my dad picks up the phone. This is when you had house phones. 
And he's talking to this person other than the line. Well, who called the house? The manager of American Eagle. Called the house looking for my brother. My dad starts talking to the manager and says, you know what you should do with my son? Fire him. Fire him. We're like, oh my gosh, what did he do? Did he steal? No, he was just late all the time or didn't show up. You need to fire my son. What did the manager do? He fired him. Yeah, this is hilarious. So my brother then walks in, <laughs> walks into the house. We're like, what's up, bro? How was your day? Anything going on? Right? I mean, this is what my dad did. Is that good parenting or bad parenting? I would say that's good parenting. He allowed, even arranged for the scorching east wind. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> And my brother watches, he lives down in Atlanta, and you'd say, Big Bear, it worked, it worked. You are very different than you were back then. God refines. God refines. He arranged for the storm. Let me make a really important sidebar here. There are storms in your life that you're in right now that God didn't arrange. This has been a week of, of tragedy that we're going through as a church. Dear friends in this church, it's been a hard week, Okay. There are storms that God didn't arrange. He allowed, but he didn't arrange. Those are different things. It's really important. Uh, there's tragedy that some of you are going through. God didn't do that. He's allowed it. There's other times in our story where God has certainly arranged the storm. I point that story out in my brother's life. I probably have even more. Because of God's love for me, he arranged. Because he wanted to get my attention. He wanted to wake me up. What's going on in chapter four? We see what God does, but I want us to see why God does it. Every Sunday of this month, we've been studying this, this book of the Bible, chasing down the key question, what is the more on the mind of God? Here's how we've answered it. Week one, we said more surrender. That's what we saw from the passage, more surrender. Week two, more salvation. This is certainly the more on the mind of God. Week three, more sending. Why? We are saved and we are sent. Last week, week four, was more sharing. This is what we do once we get there. Once he got to Nineveh, he opened his mouth. He was bold and brief, really important. This brings us today. What is the more on the mind of God? Answer, more shaping. More shaping, more shaping, more shaping. If you're wondering what God has been into and all about forever, it has always been about transformation. To shape you and to shape me more and more and more into the very image of God. More shaping. A.W. Tozer said it this way, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So when you close your eyes and you think about God, what metaphor comes to your mind? My guess is there's many metaphors that come to your mind, but I want to close today with making sure that you understand the dominant metaphor revealed to us from Scripture of who God is. That dominant metaphor is that of a potter. Did you know that? A potter. How many of you have ever been in pottery class or you, you at least have heard of pottery? Has anyone heard of pottery? Okay, good. <laughs> Isaiah said it this way. Yet you, Lord, are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. David Jeremiah said it this way. Scripture's dominant theme is a simple one. God is the divine potter and humanity is the clay. This is the why behind the what in Jonah chapter four. This is why. This is why God brings shade and this is why God brought the sun and the heat. It was to shape Jonah more and more and more into his own image. John Stott said it this way. What a great quote this is. It is inconceivable that we should enjoy a relationship with God as his children without accepting the obligation to imitate our father and cultivate the family likeness. Paul said it this way in, five, in Ephesians 5, verse 1, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. God is the potter. We are the clay. I brought today a little, little something to show you guys. In sixth grade, uh, I made this masterpiece. <laughs> we're uh, we're going to pull it up on this. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. It's amazing. Um, and... I was at Medina Middle School, 
and I remember uh, this, this class, it was in Homec, Homec, and we were going to do pottery. And I remember the teacher gave us some examples. It wasn't like, you know, do whatever you want to do. It was like, no, 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 these are like the three pictures you can look at, and then you're going to make the, the pottery. And so I looked through those options, and I, I chose the easiest one. And, uh, and so I looked at, this is really important, I looked at this picture before I started making anything. And then I was given this, this lump of clay. <laughs> and I was just doing as the, you know, the teacher taught, I added a little bit of water, you know, I'm massaging it, um, I'm shaping it. But I was shaping it into a very specific image. And as I was thinking about today, this is exactly what God does in our life. God has a very specific image that he is shaping your life into. It's not the image of your uncle, your earthly dad, your mom, as good as they might be. It is the image of Christ himself. This is why we're not done. This is why when you're saved, you're now on this sanctification journey of being molded and shaped. This is why the potter, in his sovereignty, he'll add some water at times to soften things up. And there's times where he'll cut things away. He doesn't do this to power up on you. No, he does this because there is a very clear picture that he is shaping your life into. It's the image of Christ. He's the potter. Will we be the clay? He's the potter. He's got a vision for your life. Will you work with the hands of the potter? as he shapes you and molds you. We have a one-way ticket to more shaping. It's our growth track. And there's a lot more shaping that will happen after you graduate the growth track. But these three courses are a way, a really good way, where over the next eight weeks, you can willfully place yourself right there so that the potter can shape your life. Would you do that? A few days ago, I reached out to Jeremy, and I'm like, man, you know, I want to talk about the potter. I think this is so important. I haven't preached on the potter in, I don't know, ever, years, really. Do you have a song you could do? And uh, Jeremy wrote a song a number of years ago, and then he wrote a bridge to this song like three days ago. It's fresh out of the oven. And um, we want to create some space for you guys to really meet with the potter. Is there anything in your life that you're fighting him on? Is there any level of hatred that you need to release to him? Is there any ways that you're working not with him but against him? As he sings the song over you, man, I just want you to meet with God. I want you to be open. And so let me pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this incredible book of Jonah that speaks to us today. God, I thank you that you are the potter And we are the clay. We say, come Holy Spirit, right now, would you illuminate ways in which we we need to be open and utterly compliant with the shaping that you're doing right now. God, please help us. Reveal to us. Affirm us in some ways. Convict us in some ways. We yield to you, in Jesus' name, amen.
We're almost done. Um, I want to say this. <clears throat> I think this is, yeah. Hmm. So there's there are at least one person. Your, your block, what's preventing you from surrendering your life to Jesus is something that happened. And, um, and I get it. You know, I preach a message like this and you start to understand the Ninevites and you're like, how could God let them get away with all that, you know? Murdering, torturing. John, are you saying that's the kind of God that you're asking me to surrender to? He just lets them off the hook? There's a reason you've never met anyone from Nineveh. And you never will. He's also a God of justice, Okay? And your desire to get revenge or your hang up with, and how can I surrender to a God that lets people off the hook? He does not let people off the hook. 
but would you let God be God? Would you say, okay, man, even that thing, God, I'm gonna surrender it to you. Today is the day of surrender for some of you. Realizing that, man, he's been shaping you and molding you through all of that. He's forming you. Would you work with the potter? Would you allow him to shape you into the very image of Christ? Would you surrender your life to Jesus today? Would you say, Jesus, forgive me? Jesus, I surrender. Others that have been going through some stuff, maybe it's Jesus, I trust you. I recognize I'm mid-story. I don't see how this ends. Like Jonah, mid-story. He didn't see how it would end. I trust you. I want you to know God's heart. That's just what I've been begging him for today. <clears throat> that you'd understand his heart for you. Because when you do, when you really understand the love of God, when you really understand Jesus, you say, I surrender all. How could I not? He came for my rescue. So Jesus, we love you. And we need you. You're working right now in our hearts. God, I thank you that you are the potter and I don't have to be. That is over my pay grade. You are the potter. And so in humility... In surrender. In awe of you. In appropriate fear of you. We say, we'll be the clay. Yep. You be the potter. We'll be the clay. And so God, I thank you that you are the potter. God, I praise you that even on days where I cannot understand, I cannot see it, that you are forming and shaping me into something and that something is the image of Christ. So keep molding. So keep shaping. Keep breaking us. Do whatever you gotta do. God, our hearts are crying out that we would experience a movement of Jesus in the 10 in our lifetime and we know there's no way there will be a movement of Jesus if our lives don't look more like his. God, we cry out for our kids. God, we know. Why would they want our faith unless we possess a faith that looks like Christ? Work in us as parents, as grandparents. Shape us and mold us into something so compelling that a broken world would want for their own life. You're the potter. We're the clay. We trust you. And all God's people agreed and said, amen. We love you guys. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's message. We pray that it helps you in your journey in finding and following Christ. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel or to our podcast so that you don't miss any of our upcoming messages. And we hope to see you at 82 Stratford Drive very soon.